Our reading for this morning comes from 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 through 19. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel, Samuel. And he said, Here I am. And ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call you. Lie down again. So he went and lay down, and the Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again, a third time. And he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, And lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears of it tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever and for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision of the Lord to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He said, here I am. Eli said, what was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and he let none of his words fall to the ground. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning, we are beginning our Lenten sermon series entitled, The Call. We're in a season of discernment in the life of the church, where we're opening our hearts to receive and intentionally listening for God's direction. Our prayer groups that we'll be meeting together over the next few weeks are part of this journey. And each week, as these groups are exploring themes like gratitude, confession, discipleship, and mission, our Sunday sermons will follow along. So over the next few weeks, uh, we'll examine stories from the Bible about calling and discernment, uh, stories that reveal how God calls ordinary women and men to extraordinary mission. We'll talk about only what it means for those in our stories from the Bible, but also what it means for us today. 
So we begin this series with the call of Samuel. Our our reading opened, I don't know if you noticed uh, this, with a very interesting uh, fact. It writes, the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Uh, Visions were not widespread. We're not entering into a point in the Bible that is so filled with the miraculous that it is completely unrelatable to our experience. We're moved into an age in the Bible that almost looks a bit like our own. There's no pillars of fire, no columns of smoke, no parting of seas and rivers. What is about to happen is as unusual and surprising to Samuel as it would be to any of you. Samuel lived in the temple as part of his religious education under the guidance of the priest Eli. Samuel was the beloved child of his mother Hannah, whose earnest prayers to God led to both his birth to his dedication to ministry. But the young boy is growing up in a challenging time in the life of Israel. Although Eli was a good man, his two sons, Ophini and Phinehas, were not. The younger priests abused their office. They took advantage of worshipers who came to the temple fattening themselves on sacrifices meant for God, and threatening any worshiper with violence if they tried to do the right thing. They are referred to in the chapter before as scoundrels. Scoundrels who had no regard for the Lord. And while Eli recognized his son's sins and told them to stop, he was unable to restrain their behavior. And so as time goes on, the dignity and the integrity of the temple is tarnished by corruption as Eli's own personal health declined. And this crisis in Israel and its spiritual leadership makes the lack of clarity on God's vision all the more troubling. It's as if the physical setting of our story begins to reflect this reality. In verse 3, we are told that the lamp of God had not yet gone out. Now, now on a literal level, uh, this tells us the time in which this story is taking place. Uh, Priests were required to keep lamps burning in the temple from dusk till dawn. But on a deeper level, perhaps it points to something more significant. As one scholar notes, uh, on another level, the expression may refer to both the near extinguishing of divine vision in Israel and to the waning of Eli's own role as priestly source of spiritual vision. In a time when the vision for the future is unclear, when the spiritual life has fallen into decay, God calls Samuel. God speaks into the chaos and the messiness of human life, God calls Samuel to be a prophet of change in Israel. And after this calling, Samuel will be charged with rebuilding the spiritual health and the visionary leadership of the nation. The calling of Samuel reminds me of another famous calling in the history of the church. Uh, Last year, my grandparents went on vacation to Europe, and uh, one day uh, my grandmother was in an antique shop, and she was casually browsing for souvenirs. 
And as she was walking around, uh, she came upon a replica of an old Byzantine icon in the shape of a cross. And on the wood, uh, painted in beautiful colors, stood Jesus with a peaceful gaze and arms extended in welcome. And for reasons that defy logic, I simply categorize it as grandmothers are gifted with special wisdom of the divine, my grandmother sensed that this icon would be an encouragement to my life. And so when she came back to the States, she presented it to me as a gift. And as it turns out, this cross that she was drawn to has important significance. It was the San Damiano Cross. As the story goes, uh, there was a young man who was praying inside the dilapidated walls of a nearly collapsed church building just outside of town. And being an adventurous sort, he had traveled down a spiral staircase uh, where in this darkened corner this cross still hung upon the wall praying for direction, for guidance in his life. He, he felt as though Jesus' gaze was suddenly upon him. He was filled with burning passion, and he distinctly heard his name being called with the words, Go repair my church, which, as you see, is falling in ruin. The young man was none other than St. Francis of Assisi. And at first, Francis took this calling as a literal one. He began to go around and collect stones and organize other young men to literally renovate this small little church. But soon, Francis began to understand his calling to rebuild the church in a much more significant way. God had called him to revitalize a spirit of full devotion to God, a selfless service to others, of great concern for the poor throughout the church universal. The writer G.K. Chesterton, in his spiritual biography of St. Francis, puts it this way. He was truly building up something else something that has often fallen into ruin but has never been past rebuilding. A church that could always be built anew though it had rotted away to its first cornerstone, building something against which the gates of hell shall not prevail. Although we often romanticize pacify the Franciscan legacy, there is no doubt that Francis was truly called to rebuild the spiritual life, the vitality of the church. He, he set forth an example that has changed church history that continues to inspire us today, a legacy that is connected to Samuel's calling as a challenge to us. As Samuel is called to a similar task of repairing and rebuilding, but this time the spiritual leadership of Israel. Before he can begin that work, though, there is a new beginning that requires facing honestly all that has failed. And this narrative that we read just a few moments ago does so without flinching. The message of God given to Samuel is a word of judgment for the house of Eli. The priestly family and his descendants will no longer serve the Lord in the temple. And Eli's sons will not live to old age because of their greed. Even Eli was not spared a severe sentence for his inability to stop his sons from using their privilege to abuse the poor and the weak. 
Samuel's message, it means more than just divine judgment. We watch here a transition of the guard. Leadership in Israel has shifted. Samuel is being transformed from a young boy who is ignorant of the ways of God to a prophet who speaks forth the very will of God for the people. And I find it very incredible that both Samuel and Eli are ready to accept this decision from God immediately. Did you notice that? I mean, Samuel's acceptance seems kind of natural, right? The decision for him means a position of power and authority. He is being elevated. That's easy to accept. But for Eli, this decision means loss, sorrow. Although there is much to celebrate in the calling of a young, talented prophet to lead change, the process of rebuilding cannot happen without Eli accepting and supporting the new direction of God. And it's through the faithful response of both of these leaders that we watch the history of Israel change. As biblical scholar Walter Brueggemann writes, there is a chance for newness, and that chance is rooted in Hannah's piety, in Israel's daring doxology of who God is, and Eli's yielding in Samuel's availability, in God's resolve, to do a new thing. We discover today that the process of spiritual renewal is always initiated by God and is rooted in communal listening and action. The calling placed upon Samuel and others is not easy. As the road to growth is paved with faith, hard work, persistence. He's called to do something great, but we are reminded of the spiritual challenges and the social transformations that are required. In our own lives, when we are called, it's not just about listening to what God says, but about responding in faith. To boldly face the challenges and resistance that naturally come our way. To support one another as we are called to be agents of God's prophetic word in the world. I've been thinking all this this week as I read our reading again and again and studied it. I thought about the significance of the cross that spoke to Francis. I tried to think about what it means for all of us to hear the call to rebuild the church today. For decades now in Christian circles, there's been frightening talk about the decline of the main line, about dwindling Sunday morning attendance and poor giving trends. You read article after article that almost seem like early obituaries for the church. Yet I'm reminded of the great writer Mark Twain who once said, the reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. I don't believe the church is on her deathbed. I do believe that many of our models for being church are passing away. I believe that it is time for congregations everywhere to begin to listen to God anew, to discern God's dreams for the future of our churches. It's time to look around and see the ways that God has already taken the initiative to create new beginnings. 
opportunities, to open up new possibilities in our midst. It's contrary to what you might have heard, I believe that the church is on the cusp of a great age of creativity and innovation. And this beginning will look very different than what's come before. It will carry the same spirit, but churches will look less like places that you go to and more like places that you get sent from to go make a difference in the world. It will look like Iglesia Cantico Nuevo, or New Song Church in Longwood, Florida. See, three years ago, the congregation had dwindled so small that the new pastor, uh, Jonathan Iguina, couldn't find enough people just to lead worship. But rather than focus uh, on ministries that no one was passionate about, that wasn't giving anyone any energy, like one he said was a visiting ministry that actually wasn't visiting anyone, just had a bunch of spots to fill. Instead, He focused on the call to rebuild the church's heart for growing followers of Christ, developing their spiritual life, and then sending them out to make a difference. He concentrated on nurturing the people he found, setting a focus on drawing closer to God. And As attendance began to inch up towards 90 on Sunday morning, the church's deficit was replaced with a surplus. As it turns out, there's no great magical formula to all this kind of work. Churches, large and small, particularly smaller churches in the past year, have grown, according to a recent study. But these churches have a very distinctive style to them. They are congregations that feel they are energetically and passionately living out God's calling for them as a community. Thriving congregations, big and small, are ten times more likely to try something new or do something differently. And and that's a critical piece. Rebuilding the vitality and the energy our congregations requires fresh and new vision like Samuel and the wisdom and the availability to accept of Eli. Today, I'm challenged by our reading. I'm challenged because I recognize the ways in which too often, like Francis, I have heard God's call to rebuild in a very literal sense. Let me bring back what was before. Let me repair these walls. Let me put in better lighting. And yet what is actually being called is to dream anew, to open up my imagination open up my heart, I realize that my thoughts for the future are far too small, that God has much bigger dreams for you, for me, for all of us. And so I'm excited now. I'm excited uh, about this season in the life of the church where we want to have honest conversations. We want to open ourselves to listen for the voice of God. We want to see where this journey might take us. So today and this week, I hope that you will intentionally seek ways to open yourself up to receive God's call, to to listen in prayer, in Bible study, in conversation with friends at lunch after this service. How are you being called? Sure, in some sense, we're having a conversation over the next few weeks about how God is calling us as a community, but how, how is God calling you? What in your life needs to be rebuilt, repaired, 
revitalized. The opportunity for us to begin anew, to receive new possibilities, is never closed off. Visions may be rare, but the lamp of God is not yet extinguished. May we carry that light to all the world. Amen.